I think it delivers the wrong message. Are they coming to the booth to see her or are they coming to the booth to see me? People are thinking, well, having an attractive person in the booth is going to bring people to the booth. Well, you need to bring people to the booth for a different reason. You don't want them to come to the booth because there's an attractive girl in there. If that's all you've got, then I don't think you belong there as a vendor. There's so many other different ways that you could do to have fun with it. I mean, I've seen vendors have like a mascot. One of the famous ones uh, at TNC and Funnel Hacking was the, I don't even remember the name of the company, honestly, but it, it was a pickle. So one of their employees dressed up as a big pickle. But you don't even remember the name of the company. That's the point. But, <laughs> but pickle was part of their name. And uh, the point is, is they had people at their booth the whole time because they were giving away free pickles and it was fun and engaging. And they were going around with their pickle cart with this dressed up pickle mascot person going around on the break saying to people, here's a pickle, here's our booth. And you want to come by and learn more. Having giveaways at your booth, enticing people with raffles, you know, come to my booth things like that. The promoter is the one that really helps with that when they provide as much as they can to the vendors other than a spot at the event. You know, entice people to come. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Awesome Wholesaler Experience Podcast, where we look into the many facets of the job, the career, and the lifestyle of investment and insurance product wholesaling. I'm your host, the creator of the Awesome Wholesaler Experience and yours truly, Awesome Mike. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, I have yet another very special guest. This one is very uh, practical. It's gonna provide some uh, great timely information for all of us that are out in the field uh, doing these things called meetings and conferences and really any kind of a you know get together if you wanna call it. Let me introduce you to her. Sherry Sokolowski is the owner and CEO of SLS Event Planning and Consulting, where she and her team provide organization and actual management of corporate, public, and even private events, meetings, and conferences. Now, in her previous role, she was the event planner and manager for GKIC events like their super conference, their info summit, their peak performers meetings, and really several others, elite mastermind groups. Pretty big, pretty impressive stuff. Now, she specializes in hotel negotiations, very important, speaker negotiations, event management, travel discount negotiations, and executive assistant activities for the C-suite executives of tier one organizations. And she started out by being a, uh, the, executive assess the executive assistant, easy for me to say, for none other than <laughs> Mr. Bill Glazer. And she quickly proved herself and took on the additional role as the event planner. And the rest, they say, is history. Hey, Sherry, thanks for coming on the show today. How are you today? I'm doing great. Awesome, Mike. And you? <laughs> I'm awesome. <laughs> thanks for asking. <laughs> By the way, that never gets old. I appreciate you playing in my hand there. Hey, we're going to talk about a lot of different things that are going to be really relevant to the listeners on uh, on the call, on the show, they all have attended meetings and conferences and have hosted some, have been the keynote speakers at a few, have been the booth babe or the, the vendors in the, in the galleyway. Uh, and we're really looking forward to getting some you know, great information we can use, um, as well as some entertainment, because you, my dear, have, have rubbed <laughs> elbows with some of the most interesting people in the world. Before we dig into those people, though, I want to take a time out and um, basically acknowledge and... Um, I don't know what the proper word is, but uh, just kind of pay tribute to our, um, one of our leaders. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he is the creator of this thing um, that I call, and a lot of people call Planet Dan. And of course, I'm yes. gonna call, I call Mr. Dan Kennedy, who's fallen ill, and it looks like it's going to be his last rodeo. He would appreciate me calling it that. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, but uh, yeah, so I want to just pay tribute to Dan Kennedy. Thanks, Dan for the, uh, the generational wealth changing activities that you've helped all of us. And a lot of the listeners on the show are not only students of yours, but fans of yours. And I know that Sherry and I are also a members, proud members of your, uh, your, your extended family. So Godspeed to you, mm -hmm. sir. And um, appreciate all you've done and send you off with a, a warm prayer and warm, warm, uh, warm wishes. Uh, Siri, anything you want to say to Dan or his crew before we uh, get going into this meaningless work? <laughs> it's not meaningless, but you're the living it probably is, right? Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I know I've been watching all of the tributes that people have mentioned on social media over the last couple of days since the news have gone out. The the 
the farewell letter, if you will, that Dan wrote himself, you know, what that's the classic Dan of the cartoons that followed the next day. Uh, you know, I, I have not yet expressed my feelings on Dan yet publicly, so this will be the first. Uh, as you know, being Bill's assistant all those years, the eight years or so that I worked with Bill while he owned GKIC, I had the pleasure of working with him and Dan through all of that. And Dan, oh my goodness, his gift of helping business owners and entrepreneurs with their businesses was just phenomenal. I mean, thousands of people have benefited from his knowledge. And the the one response I will say, and I actually sent this message to Vicki uh, this morning, is that, you know, with his tough bravado that he has had his whole life that we've known him, I would have thought he would have outlived us all. So this is so extremely shocking to so many of us, um, heartbreaking to many, um, but to know that he has touched the lives of so many business owners and uh, entrepreneurs out there, even kids who have strived to be business owners themselves, he's helped tremendously. Um, he was someone, uh, definitely different to work with. Uh, comparing him to Bill are completely different as far as personalities. Uh, you, you could walk up to Bill and handshake, take photos, and ask questions cons consistently. But with Dan, it had to be his schedule, his timing. And we all know that about Dan, but we know that he contributed quite a lot to us. And I, for one, am thankful that I had an opportunity to be part of that Planet Dan um, the the one I always kind of reference back, uh, Mike, is my favorite conference that I enjoyed listening to Dan was his speakers boot camp. Um, I don't remember the name of it because it was so many years ago that he held in D.C. It was a two day event where he talked about if you want to become a speaker and basically making yourself a guru. And he talked about how once you get your name out there, you really truly have to remember once you get it out there, just like we all know with social media, it's out there. And he famously talked about his mustache, you know, that he had. He could never get rid of it because it was part of who he was and who he is. And, you know, he, he had a lot of valuable information. And that one just, it really stuck with me, uh, especially when I ventured out on my own back in 2012. Uh, you know, so many people knew who I was because of running GKSC events. They knew the work that I had did for Bill and Dan all those years running their events. And, you know, I just continued to maintain that. Um, the one big transition that happened right before I went out on my own, about two years before I went out on my own, is my faith. And that changed a lot about uh, what, how I was with people and how I interacted. But it didn't really change my knowledge. It just really changed my my character, if you will, on how I cared for people and how I wanted to work with them. So when I went out on my own, that just followed. And uh, I was very grateful to know that that little hint and little business tip that Dan had given us years ago about that. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And I'll tell you, I knew you before then. I knew you when you were deep in the weeds back in 07, and you still were <laughs> very nice and pleasant to deal with. So um, you didn't, you didn't turn <laughs> yeah. into Dr. Jekyll from Mrs. Hyde, but uh, but I can appreciate that. You know, I, I'll, uh, I'll quickly try to, I'll try to do it quickly. I've told this story a million times because it is one of, the, one of those pivotal moments in my life. It was when I, went, when I met Dan Kennedy the first time. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and in, I'll, basically, I, I had driven up to the, the northeast corner of Ohio in February, uphill in the snow, both ways. You get the idea, right? It was terrible. I get mm -hmm. a little tavern that I was, uh, was across the uh, parking lot from the hotel I was staying at afterwards. And I'd had a real tough time. Bartender asks me, so what do you do? And I look at her and I go, I'm a product whore. <laughs> because I had felt <laughs> like I had just given, you know, just, just basically sold my soul for this product. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't really, just wasn't a good place to be. I look across the bar and, um, you know, the gal says, well, no, really, what do you do? I have investments and such. Look across the bar and she says, yeah, he does uh, educational planning stuff for kids whatever and so I'm, I'm thinking oh here's this guy at the bar right he's got a couple of cronies with him and they look like an unruly bunch of guys cut to the chase it's ron carruthers mm -hmm. he's a little with, unruly he's there with mike <laughs> midget and john alanis and the rest of dan's platinum mastermind group i had stumbled mm -hmm. on and booked the hotel at the same place that they held their hotel or held their meetings the, the private mastermind group. So 
I got, mm -hmm. I got, I got into a conversation with these guys. I was kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then they tell me, hey, look at this website. So for hours that night, I'm looking at magnetic marketing going, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. You know, their copy mm -hmm. just sucks you in. And, um, and the next morning I literally stalked and, and accosted Dan Kennedy in the little buffet area for breakfast as he was trying to talk <laughs> to Ron Legrand and Ryan Ipack. And, and I, and I pulled him aside and, and he was kind enough to actually talk to me. He probably thinks I was a federal agent or a tax, you know, somebody. <laughs> um, and I said, Hey, I don't know what this is, but I believe that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And he said, Hey man, go to the super conference. And that mm -hmm. started my journey uh, into this entrepreneurial venture. This goatee, Sherry, I didn't wear the goatee before. And no? I couldn't pull off the biker chops. You know, it's more of a Western thing. <laughs> now I'm kind of stuck with this too. And mm -hmm. it's interesting the, you know, it's, it's kind of um, a personification or, or it's kind of a trademark, if you want to call it that. Right. And, um, and it's funny though, I shaved it off one time. I think I screwed it up or something, cut it, <laughs> I shaved it off. And my wife was like, what happened to your face? <laughs> I, I guess I should, <laughs> grow, I should grow a bushier one, you know, and I don't know. Funny. But yeah, Dan Kennedy is, uh, he'll always be remembered. And he's, uh, he's mm -hmm. just a, a unique fellow. I think that was probably his best trait. And it wasn't that he was, you know, so technically or tactically proficient. He was very good, right. but it was that he was unique. He was special and, and unique and um, he'll definitely be missed, but he'll be, his, his life will live on in the dozens of books that he's written and a lot of the disciples that he yeah. has raised in the business. So I want to just pay tribute to Dan and thank him again for all the work and give our condolences to anyone that's, uh, that's uh, you know, grieving right now because of, of his uh, impending loss of life. So, yeah. you know, you've done a lot of these conferences for these folks and I've attended a lot of them and they are mm -hmm. remarkable. I mean, I've attended a lot of industry conferences, Sherry, and some of them are better than others, um, but every super conference, every info summit, every mastermind group meeting, every, you know, Dan's last, this kind of meeting um, is <laughs> remarkable, right? I, and I, I tell you, when I saw the first little, you know, the news of my impending demise of note, yeah. I was reading it, but I was thinking, man, this is great marketing copy. Everybody's going to think he's dead. They're going to come out of the woodwork. And I was so like, it, it hurt worse when I realized that it's not, you know, right. that he's really going to be gone here. Um, but what a great copywriter he is. Even in his goodbye letter was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's great copy. You know? But his copy pulled us into those conferences. And you, you, you know, you've, you've been an integral part of those and you've worked with a lot of different celebrities and athletes. And, but if you had to just pick one, who would be the most favorite celebrity or superstar, I think celebrity is probably the right word, that you've had the chance mm -hmm. to work with and get to know a little bit? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I could pick one. I'd, ha I'd have to say, I, I can give you my top three. Can I do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, my top three, and there's really no preferred order, if you will. Um, believe it or not, the, the best, I'll just say what I like best about each of the three, the, the, uh, George Foreman, uh, we all know George Foreman grill, you know, the German, the Foreman grills and things. My favorite part about working with George was his personality. Oh yeah. He, he was just so approachable. He was so warm and inviting and he just wanted to share his story as to how he came about the George Foreman grill. And it, it and he, I also met him at the time of life of my transition that I had mentioned earlier. So it, it even made that all more appealing to me to meet another person of faith and just to, to feel that warmth around him and, and his, he didn't feel like a celebrity, if you will, which brings me to the next person, the next person who definitely feels like a celebrity wants everyone to know he's a celebrity. If they don't know it is Gene Simmons <laughs> of KISS. Uh, you know, he was uh, our keynote celebrity speaker of one of our biggest super conferences that we had of all times. I think we had uh, just under 3,000 people there for that super conference. We had so much going on. And the reason that I liked really working with Gene is because he knew that he was confident in his stature and how he raised his kids. He told the story from the stage that he wasn't going to hand Silver Spoon to his kids. He was going to teach them how to work for what 
they want it in life. And he not just, you know, gave them the typical things that we all tell ourselves that we need to teach our children to, to be respectful, to have manners, to work hard, to show up on time. But he also taught them business management through all of what he did. I mean, his hands were in so much of business, uh, everything about the KISS brand. So, I mean, that's how he became who he was. Uh, you know, walking with him side by side, I had to go to pick him up at the airport in a limo and walk through the airport with him with the, with the driver and, you know, all of this being in the back with the, with Gene and the limo was very uncomfortable for me. And this was back in 05, or 06, I think. And so this was before my transition. So things were a lot different for me then. And I still felt a little uncomfortable of being a single woman at that point in my life in the back seat of the limo with Jean. But he made me feel comfortable. He was very talkative. And he just, I don't know, he, he wanted people to come up to him and talk to him. So he had that celebrity presence of everybody knew who he was, whether or not they, they knew it because of just how he walked around. That he caused a, a scene at the, the Gaylord restaurant for breakfast that morning, I was told. But he wanted people to come out and talk to him. Um, the, the third person is uh, Marcus Lemonis. Um, he's from The Prophet. You know, he, he took the time on, he was one of the keynotes at the Funnel Hacking Live event I did with Russell Brunson a few years ago, like two or three years ago now. And he was spectacular. He just... My job was to follow him around the room as he spoke to make sure that he knew his time because the speaker timer was in front of the stage and he didn't stay in front of the stage. He sat on the front of the stage. He walked with the audience. So I was consistently trying not to cause a scene in the audience to just let him know when, what his time was. And so he and I had that kind of eye to eye throughout uh, walking him from the green room where he got to spend time with Russell and the folks and then back to the stage. And he would take physically grab somebody's phone and take selfies with them. And, you know, when we walked him out to catch his Uber, believe it or not, he called his own Uber. Uh, we were out there with him. Um, and I said, hey, can you grab, can you do a vi quick video for me? And he goes, sure. And that's where that video testimonial is on my website because he took the time to do a 15 second video for me. And he only met me that one day. And I mean, who does that? Especially someone of his stature. So those are my my three favorite celebrities for those particular reasons. Yeah, and I actually, I uh, enjoyed, I didn't see Marcus, um, but I enjoyed George Foreman quite a bit. You know, and one of, the, one of the things that George said that I will never forget was the time where, you know, one of his guys was, was filtering the ideas that were coming in because he had a lot of people that wanted them, they wanted George Foreman to promote their product. And his mm -hmm. guy would filter them. And then one guy kind of um, kind of snubbed a product and George, George looked at him and said, what do you mean? What, what, why are you telling that guy? No. And, and the guy said, well, you know, he doesn't have enough potential or there's not enough, whatever. And George looked at him and said, he's like, Hey man, the grill is done. You know, this is, this is, you don't know what the next grill is going to be. So we need to be looking at mm -hmm. And for the, the wholesalers, even financial advisors that are on the show listening, and tune it in. Sometimes we get caught up in this product that we had that was awesome, or the advisor that we went out and saw when, when our product was red hot, and all of a sudden we're not we're not you know we're not going to go see this lower end advisor, which was actually the, the advisors that kind of got you where you were. So George mm -hmm. Foreman still recognized that to where he would talk with the people that were the ones that brought him you know got him to where he was uh, even after he had made all those millions. I think they said he sold a hundred million grills, something like that. I mean, just something like that. Yeah, it was ridiculous. That's crazy. That's like every <laughs> third person in the country. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Gene Simmons is a very colorful one, and uh, that was an interesting time too because his his business mentality and Dan's actually differed a little bit. And yes. There's a little moment of, if you remember, there's a little moment of like a tense moment when Gene said something like. Uh, you want to make your product available to everybody. And now, and, and Dan's like, well, actually maybe not, you know, <laughs> you know he wants to be the, the expert in that particular field. So it was interesting uh, to see that, but I appreciate you doing that. Any, any, um, any horror stories, you don't need to drop anybody's name or you know, <laughs> drop a dime on somebody, but I'm sure that in the, I don't know how many conferences and workshops you've uh, mm -hmm. been a part of, 
what's like the worst thing you've seen? What's the, the when, when it all went wrong, what was going on? Well, um, there's, there's probably a good handful of those over the 14 years of doing events, but if we're going to stick on celebrities or quote unquote, you know, if you want to hire a keynote speaker to come and present at your event, there are stories around that. Um, you know, we had, when I worked at the GKC event, we had a couple of celebrities, one who just completely didn't show up, you know, Suzanne Summers, you know, we all heard about that. Um, we promoted her, you knew how Dan did all this copy with him and Bill where everything was themed and everything was placed out and lined out throughout the marketing funnel. And, you know, we get there, a couple, like, I think it was less than 10 days before the event. And we found out she was in the hospital with pneumonia and she couldn't come. We're like, what are you talking about? So, you know, things like that do happen and you just have to go with the flow. What did, what did Dan and Bill do? They opened up another hour presentation. We all talked about it. And we're like, just give the attendees what they want, more of you guys. So Dan and Bill got on the, on the, stage and did a q and A, I I think, at that time. And everybody loved it. They probably got more out of that than they would out of another celebrity. So, you know, I would just say in regards to that is things are going to happen. You know, you do your absolute best to plan everything out to a T, making sure you got all your ducks in a row. If they say, I just thought it, T's crossed. Because what happens, life, you know, when, when you get on to a live event, there is something that's going to happen and you have to make sure everything else is flowing because you've prepared it and planned it so that when those bumps come up, you can handle it. Um, I can give you a horror story of another celebrity um, who's no longer with us. I won't name names, but she's no longer with us, who was, we always had, as you know, because you went to our events, we had celebrity photo time with our VIPs uh, leading into lunch. And that was, you know, I, that was one of the things that I was, I was so proud of, especially with Jean. I had to get, I think we had like 350 people. I got through the line in 45 minutes. I mean, who does that? Wow. And it was because we had great teamwork. You know, we, we went through the line and, 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 I, and I share this with everybody who's listening because these are the important details that people sometimes forget the importance of why you need to know this. When you have timed things in your meetings, your conferences and events, you have to understand the logistics that go into those timed things and what could go wrong and try your very best to prepare for it and have someone manage it. You know, you, you may not say, I, you know, I can't afford to have a planner come and manage these things, but you have to have somebody manage these things for you. So what we did for these celebrity photos is we prepared everyone as they were getting in line. I always had at least two or three people out in the lines, ready to go, letting people know the rules. The rules were when you get up there, take your name badge off. You don't want your name badge in a photo, right? Put your items off to the side before you even get up there. Take all of that off. Get up there. It's no time for personal talk. Shake the hand, say how much you're, you know, happy to meet them, take a photo and move on. Everyone needs to get a photo. If you take 30 seconds and everyone else takes 30 seconds, then that means 10, 20 people don't get to have a photo. So we always share with them these rules as they're entering in. And you have to make sure they hear it because they're busy talking amongst themselves. So if you make the announcement and that's the only time they hear it, they may not have heard it. You know, it's like that airplane sleep where you're not really asleep, but you are and you hear everything going on. So you just have to make sure people know it. And, you know, they get starstruck when they get up there. So you just have to have someone managing that whole process of getting them through it. So this nightmare story of this female celebrity speaker uh, who's no longer with us, you could probably take a guess of who she is. We had her handler call us. Now, mind you, most of the time, the handlers are the problem, not the celebrity. Okay, so keep that in mind. The handler called me on their way in from the airport and said, because they were a quick in and out. They still needed a suite so she could have a place to freshen up and, tra and change. What her rules were for the event, although we had a signed contract of what this person was going to be delivering for us, that's another hint. Make sure you have signed contracts. I don't care what kind of relationship you think you have with these people, keynote or otherwise, make sure you have signed contracts with your speakers because they need to know that you mean business. You are advertising them you are letting people know a this may not be a selling event so you got to let your speakers know in writing something that they assign and acknowledge 
that this is not a non-selling event. You're not to promote from stage. They are not to collect information from the attendees. They must remain on time. All of those key logistics that are going to matter make or break a difference in the success of your event. So keep that in mind. And it will happen when you pay tens of thousands, even 20,000s, could be hundreds of thousands to celebrities or keynotes. They will try to back out on what they physically, you know, they wrote and signed and agreed upon that they were getting paid to do. So this handler got on the phone with me on their way in saying, look, she's going to do your, your photos, but they're going to be group photos. We're not going to do individual photos with everybody. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Well, we don't have time. I'm like, we have time. Trust me. We'll get everyone through. We understand she has to get out by a certain time. We will make sure it happens. And I had to renegotiate. I had to get my um, broker on the line that helped us negotiate this deal and say, you need to step in here and make sure this happens because this is what we paid for. But do it nicely because we don't want her to turn around and get right back on the plane. And then when she got there, everything, of course, went fine. I said, this is what we're doing. We came up with, and this is, again, where an experienced planner can come into play because you have to really think on the fly for solutions sometimes. You can't focus on the problem. You got to think of a solution and move on because it's the make it or break it of a successful event. And I said, look, we may, she doesn't want to do individuals. So we're going to group people as best as we can before they get in there because she's only giving us a half hour when she was supposed to give us 45 minutes. So people, of course, weren't happy and we gave them the choice. We said, look, unfortunately, the celebrity told us this on their way in. We're doing our very best to change your mind. Here's our solution. If you don't want to be part of your group photo, you have the ability to not participate. We're sorry but we cannot do anything about it. And we just explained as nicely as we could. Most people were okay with it. Not everyone was happy, but they understood our situation and we made the best of it. And uh, so instead of having, you know, you and your business partner or you or your spouse or you and your kids with her, it was five to 10 people in the group. But because we let them know ahead of time, they got to try to choose who they wanted to be in the group photo with so that it wasn't complete strangers. So I bring that up for many reasons. One, it's a horror story. Two, oh, dozens of lessons learned there for your listeners to, to think about. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, um, would you say it's just about managing expectations, both on the celebrity side or keynote speaker side, as well as the participant side? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of one of those things, and it's even something that um, Bill and Dan is famous for saying, you know, under promise and over deliver. You know, you're not, you can't always expect, especially people that you're paying to come to have that same motto. So when you are planning out your conference or your event, and you're doing your marketing, be sure not to give so much detail of what is to happen, because they, you know, you may have someone counting on that, who has, who has paid a lot of money to be there and then they get there and they realize it's changed and then you have an unhappy customer and you may be thinking to yourself, well, it's only one half unhappy person. I'll refund them and they go on their way. Not in today's world. Back in the GKIC days, there wasn't social media. Now there is. You can have that unhappy person get right on social media and then your, your event's done for over just one unhappy person. So just be careful about what you advertised and, it, and just think to yourself, under promise and over deliver, especially in the marketing of the details. Yeah, that's good advice. Let's dig into the, uh, the, nuts, the nuts and bolts, if you would, of, of mm -hmm. events. Now, uh, as a wholesaler financial advisor, I've seen and done events, I mean, literally, uh, probably every type of a venue that you can think of. Um, so let's, let's kind of narrow it down to maybe three, and then I want you to maybe give, you, give us your wisdom on when to use it, when not to use it, and maybe some advanced uh, strategies. First one is the, the, the hotel. Basically, you have a, a five-star hotel or even a three-star hotel that has a room that you can, that you, can you know, do a presentation or a meeting in. Um, what, do you, what do you say or what do you think, Sherry, is the best time, best place, best scenario to use that kind of a, of a hotel-based facility versus a, a real conference center that is that doesn't have sleeping rooms there and it's designed just for banquets and weddings and, and those kinds of uh, larger venue uh, events. 
Uh, that's a great question, and I'll and I'll if it's okay by you, I'll add to it a little bit more than that because it's not just about, you know, is a conference center have rooms or not? Because some of them do, believe it or not, they're just not as fancy as a hotel one is. Uh, hotels, in my opinion, are best used if you're going to have more than a two a two day or longer conference. Why? Well, common sense will tell you it's because people are going to wind up staying the night, um, and you want not only your guests but your speakers and your staff as well to have the convenience of being able to go right upstairs or right around the corner to get rest, change, and, and what have you. Um, so hotels are great for an event that you're going to have that is two days or longer. Um, there's lots of other benefits to having your event at a hotel. Most of the time, it's not always, but I'm going to say probably 95 to 98% of the time, you do not have to worry about renting the items that are required to put on a successful event such as risers for your stage, tables and chairs and linens, things like that, um, that you're going to need because you have to have an event. And those are the typical things you're going to have to have to put on a conference. And most of the time, the hotel will have that in their inventory, unless, of course, you're looking at some sort of extravagant setup. Um, so, so that's also the benefits of having it at a hotel. Um, the other benefit of that is the staffing. Hotels are... I'm going to say most of the time, because you may have some nightmare stories that happen where they're understaffed, but most of the time, hotels are very staffed appropriately for the handling of events. What I mean by that is they have their setup crew that is separate from everything else. Their responsibility is to make sure the tables and chairs and linens that you need are taken care of. The room setup is taken care of, especially if you have multiple rooms. They have banquet staff. So if you have coffee, if you have tea, you know, any kind of food services going on, they have banquet staff that will take care of that. Then they have the convention service manager people that will be taking care of overseeing everything, security. So they're completely staffed to be able to handle your event where you don't have to worry about, well, who do I call if something goes wrong? That leads me to conference centers. Conference centers. Um, I just put a video you, you and I talked about on my YouTube channel about a conference center experience I just had recently that was not an extremely positive experience to say. Uh, they kept telling me, we're not a hotel. We're not a hotel. The benefit of a conference center, I'm going to talk about positives first. The benefit of a conference center is they are equipped to, to have everything that you need on site as far as tables and chairs, um, the technology part of what they do in a conference center, in most, maybe not in all, is probably better than a hotel. And what I mean by that is, is in a conference center, it's usually like a lecture hall type of atmosphere. Um, the one that I was just in had two separate areas. They had conference center rooms that look like lecture halls where they had lots of small rooms. They had even some sound rooms where you could video record and audio record straight from the sound room and you didn't even have to be in the space. They had huge drop down screens. They had beautiful in-house sound that you didn't have to worry about bringing your own speakers and all of this tied into everything. That's the benefit of a conference center because it's built properly to handle that kind of thing. And it's a lot more smoother and you don't have to worry about do I have this wire do I have that wire how does this sound how does that sound it's that's just how they are so that's that's one benefit the other is they're usually managed through packages so they'll they'll have a break center area where coffee tea sodas all anything you could think of is out there two times a day they'll usually have some sort of snacks depending on what you want that's the depending on the type of package you get and you pay that price per head. The benefit of that is you don't have to worry about, am I ordering enough food through a typical hotel banquet style because you're trying to play around with the numbers to save money. Here, you know upfront, I'm getting all of this, lunch, breakfast, breaks, sodas, coffee, for this price per person. So you know, Mike, at the end of the day, what you're going to be spending based on the number of people. There's no second guessing. So those are the big positives out of it. The negative is their staffing is set up completely different than a hotel is. So if you're going to have an event that's more, that's two days or more, you need to keep that in mind on you're not going to have someone who's coming in and checking on you every day like you will at a hotel. You're not going to have banquets coming in and cleaning up for you all the time. They are going to do it one time a day. 
That's very important a lot of times in an event where they're consistently coming in on your breaks and cleaning up. They're not staffed appropriately at a conference center for that. They're only going to come in on lunch. So, so those are the pros and cons. I could probably go into more cons, but I think that's enough to get people to have an understanding. Um, a third place. That's a very good, uh, excuse me, that's a very good um, sure. point though, is the level of service because the hotel is used to yeah. being at your service, yet they don't have the technical, the, the, the technology that the hotel does. With the hotel, if you don't need all the lights and cameras in action, they're going to take much better care of you. So I think it wouldn't it be, it basically would be um, the promoter's personality. Like if the promoter yeah. wants all the bells and whistles, but not the help, they'd go to the, comp the convention center and if they wanted the help, they would go to the hotel. You were going to mention the third one before I so rudely interrupted you. What, uh, what, what, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Sometimes, hey, this is your show. Sometimes I can go on and on and on. Um, a third opportunity for having an event, of course, is a, con is a convention center. You know, there's, there's other types of venues. There's universities, there's libraries, uh, museums, you know, really cool fancy places that you can go, concert halls, things like that. But, all of those honestly kind of follow the un umbrella of a convention center. And it's because of the way that they're managed. They are usually managed under sort of like a, a union type umbrella, if you will, where everything, pretty much everything. Now it's not always the case. It depends on the location is rented. So you got to rent the space. You got to rent the chairs. You got to rent the tables. Uh, you got to use their labor, you know, all of those. So, Convention centers really come into play, honestly, when you have, I would say, three days or more or a huge event. Now, what I mean by huge event is if you can't fit into a hotel, you know, we're talking about somewhere of 5,000 attendees and up where you just, you, you can't possibly fit into a hotel. I mean, a great, a great conference that a lot of people, I don't know if your attendee, your people on the show know is traffic and conversion. You know, they TNC, they've been in a hotel, the same hotel for a number of years. They moved to another hotel that's slightly bigger. And now they're going to have to go to the convention center because their, their numbers are just growing and growing and growing. With that comes challenges. Now, as long as you know what those challenges are before you have to be faced with them, then you can manage them. I mean, that's the whole key to this, right, is knowing what your challenges are going to be, if they happen or not, and knowing how to be able to manage it properly. What do you what do you think is the best size? Like you want to be impactful, you want to have a great conference, you want it to be uh, revenue conscious, you want it to be a win win. What's the right size of as far as attendees and even length of conference? Or the best, I should say. Yeah, that that's a good question, and it honestly goes back to what you were saying earlier. For you no, know, depending on who that promoter is, right? If they're a techie person and they want all this tech support, or if they want service on site. It really depends on your message. Um, you know, a lot of times people will come to me and they'll ask me particular questions before we even get started. And I have to ask them questions before I can really give them a proper answer. So to your response is, it depends on what your event is all about. Now, if you, you want to just get in front of as many people as possible, then, and it's your first event, then I would say your perfect goal number is probably 300. Um, knowing full well that you may not reach that number, but you could go over it. So 300 is a really realistic goal for, I want to get in front of as many people as possible for my first time around. Um, a, it does it have to be 300 for it to be successful? No. I've seen and managed events that are 20 people or less where they've walked away with hundreds of thousand dollars of profit because the event was so successful. It was a high-end type of event. So it just really de depends on what your goal is and what your message is. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, a good tip. Um, I, I think that it, it depends on, you know, if the promoter wants to have an army of staff and an army of cats that he's trying to herd or she's trying to herd. Yeah. Uh, and then okay. Can I throw something else out there for you, Mike? Uh, you know how we were talking about GKSC events. So this is a great example. If you recall back in the day, you know, they have super conferences and they have info summit, right? Two totally different events. The info summit was always smaller. Why? Because the info summit was for info marketers. Info marketers who are already in the info marketer business, who have an information business, or they want to learn what it's all about. And that's, that was just a smaller 
world, right? Super conference was anyone and everyone in a business or who wanted to be in a business and learn what it's all about. So, so that's, a, I guess, a good reference point as to what I was trying to say. Yeah, that makes complete sense. You know, I want to ask you some technical, some technical questions about uh, what your opinion is. Uh, and this isn't really no, no order, but um, I, it was interesting to hear about the different types of microphones that are out there. And I've even experienced it over my broadcasting career. I know what the difference is between an Audio-Technica and a Rode microphone and a, you know, a dynamic and a condenser. And there's all these different types of microphones. Um, what are your feelings about microphones? And really, what do you say to the guy that says, no, no, I have a booming voice. I don't need it to use a microphone. Uh, I'm going to say, well, it's not about what, how booming your voice can be. It's about what we want to capture. If you're video recording or audio recording your events, everyone has to be on a microphone. Uh, this is a huge pet peeve with me with events uh, when you have a lot of engagement and interaction with the audience, especially if your event is small and intimate and you've got a lot going on. I'm, I'm like, I have to constantly remind them you need them on a mic. So microphones are very important. If you are, I'm just going to say microphones are very important because there really is no reason you should not be recording your events. It's things that you can reuse for so many different things afterwards, you know, product or marketing the next one. I mean, marketing your own business. I mean, there's so, so many things that you can use. And if you don't get it, there's no do over. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, it's not really about can the audience hear you? It's about yes. what's the quality going to be on the tape because that exactly. might be too far away and it might, there might be noise in between you and the microphone. So that's another yes. angle that I hadn't thought of. I always, I always thought, and I was taught that, you know, the average age of the person in the crowd that I was speaking to is a retiree. So their hearing capability is already mm -hmm. much less than my 30 year old, robust, four year old, robust voice that I was projecting. Um, mm -hmm. and my ears thought my voice was louder because my ears were better. So it's interesting. Not only is it for the audience's sake, but it's also for the promoter's sake that they need to use the microphone. It is. Yeah. I appreciate that too. So the, um, you know, a lot of the wholesalers have been stuck at a booth, all right, as a vendor mm -hmm. and uh, amongst the, you know, the plethora of other vendors that are out there. When you're doing a conference, what are, what are some of the different, um, maybe best practices that, that you've seen or used and to where to position the vendors? Do you have them inside the main area? Do you have them on the hallway? Do you have them next door? <laughs> where do you put them? <laughs> uh, great question. Um, I always like to say the best answer to that is where your traffic's going to be. Uh, I, there's very rare occasions where having them inside the room is a good idea. The, and I'll tell you, the only, I'll spend just a minute on that. The only time, in my opinion, you should have vendors inside of the room is if you have enough break time, the breaks are long enough, not 15 minutes or 10 minutes a couple times throughout the day, half hour breaks, an hour and 15 minutes or longer at lunchtime because you're taking the business away from the vendors because you don't want them talking and engaging with anyone during the event. Now, you may think that having the vendors inside the room during the event is the best thing for everyone because they get to see what's going on. Well, give the vendors permission to come in inside the room when there's nothing going on. You know, that's how you, you get around that. Also, if you're recording your events, you can give the vendors free recordings for the investment of coming to your event. So, you, you know, it's just really never a good idea unless they're part of the event itself. Let, let's clarify this. So, so there's two points. One is where do you put the table with all of the brochures and the little light up bouncy balls and all the free ink pens, you know, uh, where do you mm -hmm. put those? And then you, you made me think of a different a different issue though is like the actual person do you do you let the person that is the spokesperson for that company the vendor do you let them actually in the room to be a part of the audience um you know for the other present the other presenters as well so does that, does that make sense what i'm trying to ask you first one is where mm -hmm. do you put the the vendors do you put them so that it's they're right in the main area of traffic or do you put them in a special place like the vendor pit that's a separate room that you know the attendees can go to if they want to be hounded by the vendors or do you or, and then the second question is do you let the vendors actually go into the room where the keynotes are being presented as well uh, the answer to your first question is 
the, the, the foot traffic that I'm talking about. So if you're going to be providing coffee and tea on breaks and things like that, I always suggest putting the vendors in that area. Whether it's in the foyer space, pre-function space, there's multiple names on what that is. And basically what that is, is the hallway right outside the main session room. If you are in a location where that hallway is large enough to have the six foot tables that are skirted and everything, um, it really depends. Again, you know, you've got those where they're, they're the huge among us type of sponsor area where it's pipe and drape everywhere and all of that. In my opinion, I think that's old. It's, it, it should never be brought back again. There's so many different things you could do to make things look better than that. Um, but yeah, I would have that where people are going to be going through to get coffee and tea um, and go to the restroom. And the reasons for that is because you want your vendors who have invested a lot of money to be at your event to get foot traffic. It is up to them to attract attention to their booth. Now, if you have the right concierge service to help them along that process on what they can do, or if you're going to offer some sort of fun program throughout the event to entice attendees to engage with the sponsors individually, like a passport program or prizes or scavenger hunt, you know, all kinds of things you can do, then, you know, then you don't necessarily have to have them in the foot traffic area because they're going to go seek them out anyway. But, you know, I just, I think really the bottom line is here, Mike, is you want to make everyone happy. The, the bet, no one, not everyone is ever going to be happy. You're always going to have someone who's not happy, no matter what you try to do. GKIC used to have them in the, in the hallways all the time. Sometimes we had upgraded levels where they were in the room or, you know, we had so many vendors that part of them had to be in a separate space than the people out in the vendors. When that happened, the people inside the room were not happy because they didn't get as much traffic. So my opinion is no matter what, have all your vendors in the same location. Don't have them separated if possible because it may not be worth it. You may have some vendors who are unhappy. Again, what happens when you have unhappy people? Word spreads no matter how great everything else was. Negativity unfortunately rules in that area. Um, so, so that's where I would have it in your traffic area um, well, because you don't, you want them to come back, yeah. right? Well, it's interesting because uh, yeah, I've been a uh, more than dozens, but uh, so many conferences, and I can, you know, I can, uh, I can remember, um, you know, seeing a guy that I've been trying to get to talk, trying to talk to, and the guy literally has to keep his head down, and eyes in front of, you know, his feet as he's walking to the men's room, because he's being pecked to death by vendors that have been waiting outside the door, you know, to talk to him. Hey, let me talk to you about it. so. You uh, know, yeah. it was whether it was Dan Kennedy or Bill Glazer that said, "Hey, don't come up and talk to me when I'm at the urinal." <laughs> right. <laughs> That's off limits. <laughs> it's both. Man. Probably, probably both. Probably both. Yeah. So, no, I'm, so I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. That honestly, that's where your management as the host comes into play, right? You you got it just like with speakers, you got to put rules into place with your vendors, have agreements in mind with them as well, so that they know the rules of the game. Look, man, you know, don't don't be. And I've had to do that before. I've had to police it. You know, don't stand at the door. Number one, that's not your booth. Stay at your booth. Engage people to come to your booth by what you have at the booth. You know, if you if talk, someone's we're walking, we're by. gonna talk about that one second. The engagement at the booth, but I want to yeah. just you in the audience. Like my favorite scenario was when there is a separate room for all of the vendors, and then yes. the, the advisors are incentivized. The attendees are incentivized to get a stamp on a card, and that makes them go sure. to every booth and gives the vendors a chance to open, engage, you know, in conversation with them. But you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you want to attract them to your booth by what you have at the booth. So I have to, I have to ask you, is it prudent? Is it smart? Is it ethical to have a booth babe at the convention? I can't tell you how many models, or at least, I mean, you would think they were models, are standing at these booths. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, are they going to come see me or are they going to go try to talk to her? So what is your opinion on that? Is that just, you know, fair play or is it something that's really short sighted and maybe, maybe long term, it's not a good thing to do. Uh, I think it, I think it delivers the wrong message. You know, it's, 
because like you just said, you, you kind of answered your own question of, are they going to come, are they coming to the booth to see her or are they coming in the booth to see me? You know, the, people are thinking, well, having an attractive person in the booth is going to bring people to the booth. Well, you need to bring people to the booth for a different reason. You don't want them to come to the booth because there's an attractive girl in there. If that's all you got, then I don't think you belong there as a, as a vendor. There's, there's so many other different ways that you could do to have fun with it. I mean, I've seen vendors have like a, um, like a mas mascot. Uh, one of the famous ones uh, at TNC and Funnel Hacking was the, I don't even remember the name of the company, honestly, but it, it was a pickle. So one of their employees dressed up as a big pickle. But you don't even remember the name of the company. That's the, that's the point. But, <laughs> but pickle was part of their name. And ah. the point is, is they had people at their booth the whole time because they were giving away free pickles and it was fun and engaging. And that's they were annoying. going around with their pickle cart with this dressed up pickle mascot person going around on the break saying people, here's a pickle, here's our booth. If you want to come by and learn more. And it was engaging. It was fun. It was engaging. Um, you know, having giveaways at your booth, enticing people with raffles, you know, come to my booth, uh, things like that. The promoter is the one that really helps with that when they provide as much as they can to the vendors other than a spot at the event, you know, entice people to come. And again, having them in another room, as long as they're all together, I'm, I'm good with them being another, you know, sponsor village is a, is a great way to call it, uh, as long as they're all together. You know, if you've got them separated because of the amount of sponsors you have and the space that you're limited to, then you're causing a whole nother level of stress and it and more logistics that you have to worry about. So either because traffic can be there, right? So if they're all in another room, as long as you as the promoter get traffic to go there, everyone will be happy. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's interesting. I do see that people that use, you know, the shiny objects, whether it's a, you know, a pretty gal or a bouncing ball that lights up, or they have a celebrity that's going to sign a book, you know, a book signing between right. celebrity or uh, free, free appetizers and a drink, you know, yeah, there's, then, there's all kinds is, of things that, that you can do absolutely is just the, you know, call it the spark. And I've quickly found mm -hmm. out that the quality of the advisor that actually wants to engage in a conversation Yes. That that's worth, that's worth me letting, call it, you know, the, the, the rats go to the Pied Piper, you know, and if they're only there because that's the only chance they're going to have to talk to a pretty gal is to talk to that one at the booth. I might not want them as a client anyways. I often tell people that yeah. my name is Awesome Mike, not Awe Everyone Mike. So I'm really tired of <laughs> who nice. I'm looking for. Yeah. So... <laughs> If, a, if, a, if I'm doing a presentation and I'm, I'm promoting my company's product to this mm -hmm. audience that can then use the product and I have uh, brochures and I have stuff, do you recommend that I pass all of that out beforehand or do you recommend that I hold that and make it so that they have to come get it or I pass it out at the end of the program? What do you think has been the, the best success that you've seen? Uh, I'd say the best success of getting people to your, to your booth is to be able to give them something beforehand, uh, whether it's materials that they get handed out at registration, it could be a brochure, it could be a pamphlet that the promoter puts together of every, all the vendors. The big thing to get them to your booth is an enticement. So you can put brochures in there um, and hand them out prior to or hand them out at the time of you speaking. Um, as long as it's beforehand, you know, it's, it's on the seat, like I call it seat drops, right? But you have to entice them to come to your booth. Now, most of the time, I could be wrong in this, but most of the time when a vendor is speaking from stage, they're not really technically selling from the stage. They're enticing them to come to the booth. And you're really, you're, you're kind of, if the promoter is doing their job right, you, you're limited on what you can say. So the materials can do the talking for you. So the materials that you hand out can have a special offer in there. And all you have to do is say, if you haven't seen the brochure, it's important for you to have it before you come to the booth. That way, the brochure is doing the talking for you. So yes, definitely something prior to, to bring them. But don't just let it be a, a, an advertisement. Put something in there, some sort of special offer that's going to want them to come and find out more about it. Yeah, and then as a, as a vendor, um, I found my best success was when I had my 25-person hit list. And this was because I knew who was going to be there, and I wasn't just going to leave it to chance that the, the person would, you know, cross paths with me. 
it was a hit list and I, I had the ability to do some research and even be thoughtful. Uh, one time I knew that a guy's kid was playing baseball and he was actually looking at, you know, post high school baseball. And we were in a, in a, in a town where there was a little bit of a, a professional baseball training facility. And, and I arranged it so that we got a chance to go there. And nice. the, the guy was, was blown away by it. And I was able to, to tell him about a little bit of, about what we do as a product company, but more I was able to build that relationship, which allowed me to follow up after. So Sherry, I see a lot of folks actually try to, they try to like, you know, do the whole deal at the conference as opposed to just using the conference as a lead generator to then get permission yeah. to follow up and build a relationship. Am I in line with, with what's right or would you have a different opinion on how to use the conference to, to generate new business? I think it depends on what your business is about. Um, definitely lead generation is a must. You want to be able to follow up with people after the event because uh, especially if there's hundreds of other vendors around, you know, that they're, they're going to be inundated. So you, they're not going to remember everything all the time. So you have to consistently follow up with them. Um, the, the multiple ways of doing this, by the way, is to make sure that they not only have information about your business and who you are, but a photo of the person that they have either talked to or the person that they're going to be talking to so that they, they become familiar. You know, that's, that's one of the things that I learned over the years of GKIC. That's what my business card looks like. I've got a photo on it because they meet so many people. They're like, oh, yeah, I remember that person. Now, might not remember the name, but they remember the face. Um, but I'd say that if you have a high-end product, service, deal, whatever you want to call it, that you were trying to uh, sell while you're at the, because a, ben, a lot of vendors are different, right? Some of them are high level where they're thousands, ten thousand dollar type of service or product, where others is just a few hundred. So the few hundred could be so many leads, it doesn't matter. Don't waste your time on trying to talk to so many people at one time. But if your service is tens of thousands, that if you only walk away with a few of those, you've you've already paid for your booth, and then the rest you can follow up on. So if it's a high dollar, then I'd say make sure that you focus time on that. The best way to do it is to make appointments. Don't try to, to force everything in on the small breaks during that time. Um, you know, let the promoter know up front what you're going to do so that you're not turned off while you're there saying, what are you doing? You got people at your booth. And then, no, 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 I made this arrangement. It's okay. You know, so make sure that you, you, you get that. It's not one of those things where you want to ask for forgiveness later because you don't want to be in the middle of a sale when you're forced to be shut down. So definitely it matters on what it is you're selling. Yeah. I like that. And ours is definitely the higher end to where if you get one client, they can generate millions of dollars of revenue for your company. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the idea of setting an appointment. And what I found though, is that that sometimes is, is not possible for the initial interaction. So I've kind of got a two pronged approach. My 25, are people that I want to make contact with that I haven't been able to make contact with in the past. And then those appointments can be set with people that I have a warm relationship with. Maybe they're not customers yet, but I can set up an appointment to show them this or to have them meet with this expert that we brought in from our home office just for this event that they wouldn't get a chance to meet back in Detroit um, because they're from California and, and the such. Hey, let's, uh, let's yeah. kind of wrap this up a little bit, Cher. I appreciate your time. And I think that you and I could talk forever as I've been able of to. Of course. Yeah. I don't think we even scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I do think there's a lot of value for, uh, for the listeners and the people that are tuned in. Um, but let's talk about, you know, what you actually are doing now, because in, in addition to uh, still running these, running some events and such, you're now opening up your services to, to the world. So can you mm -hmm. tell us about SLS event, mar event planning and management, and then even more, um, how can we get in touch with you if we want to consider you for some consulting or even to, to hire you to, to operate and run one of our future conferences or meetings? Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share that. Uh, yeah, so I've been running SLS event planning and consulting now for over seven years. And uh, a lot of what I do is working with clients on, of course, finding their venue for them, negotiating favorable contracts that bring ROI for hiring me. And that comes into play on many different realms. You know, the clauses I negotiate, the concessions I get for you, and the time that you get to gain back because you've got someone else taking care of that for you. Uh, the consulting part of it comes into play when we talk through the strategy of putting the events together. 
So that's a lot of what I've been doing more so these past few years, in addition to finding the right venue for you, is talking through the strategizing of mapping out what that event looks like. Uh, you know, come to me for an idea of this is what I'm what I want to have happen. How can I achieve it? And we talk through that. And through that consulting process, not only do we figure out ways to map out what that event looks like, but how it ties into your business. Because I believe live events aren't just a one and done thing. If done properly and strategically, it can grow your business and it can really take you to that next level um, in areas that you didn't even know could be possible until you get out there and do it. Because everyone knows that when you're at a live event, you never know what you're going to learn. And when you put on your first live event and you think your audience wants this, and then all of a sudden during the event, you discover not only do they want this, but they also want that from you. And they can't wait to get that from you. And as a promoter, you're like trying to figure out how to, how do I handle all of this? And that's kind of another way that I come into play on figuring all of that out for you, not only just leading into it, and after the event, but during the event, the on the fly decisions on how can we take advantage of what we just learned from our attendees as this event's happening and try to grab some of that momentum while we can and follow it to the next one. Um, so those a lot, that's a lot of what I've been doing. Uh, I just created a YouTube channel uh, about a few weeks ago. It's uh, SLS event planning is a YouTube channel. And a lot of that is going to be uh, content wrench on building blocks of the different building blocks of what it takes to put a successful event together. It's really kind of an educational thing on the things that you have to look for and listen for um, and the important parts of really piecing a successful event together. You'll find some, eventually I'm putting all my testimonials on there, of past clients I've worked with as well as uh, the, the occasional rants or success stories of live times that I'm going to be at events where I'll get on and I'll talk about something that's just happened and I've experienced because I'm always learning. Yeah, I've been doing events for 14 years, but every single time I learn something new, at least one thing, if not more. Um, and the way that they can get a hold of me is they can um, reach out to me through email. That's sherry at sleseventplanning.com. S-H-E-R-R-I-E at sleseventplanning.com. Um, they can contact me through the YouTube channel. Uh, and if they contact me as a referral right through you, awesome, Mike, they'll get an awesome discount just for, for mentioning it. And depending on what level of service they want will depend on, on the type of discount they receive. Well, thanks for that. And, and uh, if you're a wholesaler that's tuned in or a financial advisor, um, you probably have a, a marketing department that is cloaked as also the event planning department. And what ends up happening, Sherry, is that they don't communicate or connect with the sales. They put on a great yeah. event, but then there's some kind of a gap. You know, they say, hey, the event was there and sales didn't, uh, didn't you know, sell enough or, or what have you. And they, they need that. They really need an outside view, uh, an outside consultant to come in and help them put together the pieces, who should attend, what's the sales process look like. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Sherry has a unique um, position because she's actually dealt with some of the best in the world that were selling from the stage that had products available, that had continuity programs available. They've dealt with direct and indirect sales from virtually every business that's out there. So really her knowledge is priceless. I encourage you to check it out. Hey, Sherry, I always ask the guests on the show my two signature questions before we close here. All right, now, mm -hmm. don't worry. Um, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is no wrong answer, by the way, but uh, some answers okay. are better than others, let's just say. So, uh, okay. and, yeah, and you're up, you're up against guys like Dave D and uh, some oh. other folks that you know, Sean Buck, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Malin Check's coming on in a couple of weeks, so we'll see what I'll, oh, I'll, cool. I'll hear him for you, yeah. Um, but here you go. Question number one. If you picked up the phone, Sherry, and on the other end of the phone was a young and bright, brand new um, event planning guru named Sherry. And I used to know your maiden name. It's not Sokolowski. It's, what is your maiden name, Sherry? Well, my previous married name was Russell. That's what a lot of people remember. Sherry yeah. Russell. Sherry Russell. Yeah. Well, let's go back even further. And let's go back to these, when you first got started into the event planning business. And that mm -hmm. Sherry was on the line. I'm talking about 14, 15 years ago at least. You had a couple of minutes to give her some advice. What advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, my goodness. Wow. 
Um, I would say to be prepared to always learn, uh, not just from the people in your environment, but from the people outside of your environment. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, I think the people that were in the GKSC world or Planet Dan world will understand when I say they were best known for, don't just go to the people that uh, know the event industry and learn from them, but go to say the sales industry and take what they're doing and learn that right away. I think that was even in Dan's tribute letter is that's the big thing you need to learn is sales. Uh, and it's, and it's really because not just the knowledge, but it's the courage, you know, it's the courage to be able to step outside the comfort zone. I mean, my husband teases me now to this day saying you're really bad at trying to sell yourself, you know, just when it comes to that. And I see that happen so many times with speakers on stage over the years is they're so great. I was going to use the word awesome. They're so awesome at, tell, you know, selling themselves. I need, a, stage. I need a bell to ring or a gong. <laughs> you know, says awesome. Bang. Yeah. <laughs> um, because of, you know, they, they know what they're doing and they can, they can sell it easily. But then when it comes to the, okay, it's time to close they shrivel up, right? And and then their sales just go kaput because they, they've lost that confidence. So that that would definitely be be my answer to myself. Yeah, very good. And um, I like that. In fact, that was one of, uh, you know, Dan and Bill's biggest things was um, any, any, and Dan would use some colorful language, but any, any moron can say, oh, yeah. that, that won't work in my business. You know, right. and what you're saying is to, to open up your eyes and ears and be open to learning from things outside of your business. And that's where the real genius is, is to take a, a technique that's working in another business and apply mm -hmm. it towards your business, like the banking industry. You know, the old story is that Ray Kroc was there with, uh, with, with one of the McDonald brothers going up and making a withdrawal from the bank. And they go through the little side window and they're like, we should do this with our restaurant. That was before any drive through windows had ever been in, invented. And that, that's what the, like one of the biggest wins for McDonald's was is when they invented the drive through window. They could have easily been like, yeah. oh, no, that's not going to work for, uh, for restaurants. Right. That's a banking yeah. thing. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Question number two, Sherry. And this is a little more fun. Uh, not that that wasn't fun, but this is a little more fun. <laughs> if I could grant you, if I could grant you any legit superpower, which one would you choose and what would you do with it? Oh, wow. Um, the ability of speed. Yeah, I, I would say the, the ability of speed because there's so much that has to get done in one day. Uh, and my reasoning for that is because I, have, I work from home. I, main reason I did uh, was started my own business is so we could start a family and I could work from home and not have someone else raise my child. So we have a beautiful six-year-old little girl who will, and we homeschool her, who will come into my office occasionally, mommy, when can I, when can we play? When can we do this? When can we do that? And I'm like, honey, I'm working. We are always working. Well, if I can get through it faster, still with the, you know, getting things done quickly, but still doing it well, then uh, that's my reasoning behind it so that I can have more time with my family. That's fun. That's fun. Um, some of the other common answers are the ability to read people's minds. And then, oh, I don't want to know that. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then another one is um, be able to teleport, which that's another speed thing as well. I think that's an American mm -hmm. thing. You know, we want everything, we want more and we want it faster than, than slower. You know, I think it's American, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I think the reasoning behind me saying it is because I, I don't want more of other stuff. I want more time with my family. And I, you know, want to be able to continue to serve and help so many people in the event industry with their businesses. And, you know, if I can speed, speed that up a little bit more, then I can also give the same level to my family. Hey, well said, well said. Hey, appreciate you coming on the show. And Sherry, I want to tell you personally, thank you, because you've been a big part of a lot of people's success, mine in particular, but a lot of people, probably thousands of people, if not millions, uh, indirectly, indirectly, of, of, of their success by your work, by your attitude, mm -hmm. by your patience, and by your skill in helping set up and facilitate these events and groups. So on behalf of them, I can also say thanks. Um, and we wish you the best thank of you. luck. Yeah, and, and your next... Um, you know, your next venture um, after this one, and even if it's just a new version of it, 
but definitely hope that SLS is, uh, is prosperous and uh, fortunate, you know, from, from now and in the future. And as we say on the Awesome Wholesaler Experience podcast, Sherry, it's about the journey and uh, we wish you well on yours. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And a huge thank, thank you, you to everyone. You're welcome. Huge Jeff, thank you to everyone for tuning in today. And if you haven't already done so, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like, click on the little bell and you'll be notified when a new episode drops. Don't want to make, you want to make sure you don't miss one. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and for supporting the show. And as always, thanks for being awesome. Okay, everybody.